Welcome back to theCUBE. It's Jeff Frick here at the O'Reilly Fluent Conference at the Hilton Hotel in San Francisco. You're in theCUBE where we go out to the events, we extract the signal from the noise, we try to find the smartest people that we can in the room and uh, ask them the questions that you would ask if you were here. We invite you to join the conversation. The hashtag for the event is FluentConf. Uh, hashtag FluentConf. So with, uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Irene Roos to the uh, to the cube. Welcome, Irene. Thank you. It's great, great to be here. So Irene uh, had a portion of the keynote. There was a lot of keynotes this morning. There were. And yeah. yours, uh, and you're from Boku. So before we jump in, why don't you give us a little bit about uh, what you do at Boku? Sure. Um, so Boku is uh, an open web technology company, and that means we do three things: uh, we do consulting and training and community development, and all really in the name of making open source uh, a viable alternative to closed source software. So we believe that if uh, open source becomes uh, stable and widespread and if people uh, use it and start uh, incorporating it into their process and contributing back, that's really how you um, give it a viable future. So we've been working really hard on, uh, you know, with our clients, but also with a lot of open source contributions. Um, you know, from the Boku staff to just kind of really promote that mission. Okay, so your uh, your keynote was titled "The ABCs of Visualization," but I think you uh, you changed it during the keynote to uh, I, to I make did. better charts, right? Or uh, uh, architect better architecting charts. better charts. That's right, which is still ABC. So exactly. I feel like it kind of fit in. Um, yeah, it was a bit of a decoy. Well, you know, because we were announcing a new library, and I didn't want to put that in the title, obviously. So, um, and you know, they were still very much related because I think building. Um, you know, the ABC of data visualization is, is you know, part of it is making charts and, right. and thinking about how to do that right, I think is a really big question in right. one's mind. So let's talk a little bit about uh, kind of architecturally in terms of, of visualizing data and, and, and kind of what are the objectives? Because on one hand you think, wow, it'd be, it's super obvious if I can see a picture's worth a thousand words and, and I've got this massive sea of stuff over here and then of course everybody's talking about big data and the internet of, uh, you know, the industrial internet and the massive information coming off a jet engine flying to Tokyo and we've all heard the sure. things, right? But, and, and, I'm, and I see, wow, that's interesting, but is there so much data in there? How do you put that into a visual perspective? So from kind of philosophically, when you talk to clients or you talk to people that want to get a better handle on their data through visualization, what are some of the kind of key frameworks and ideas that help drive sure. that process? Sure, um, there, there's a bunch of questions in bunch there. Bunch of questions, so you could pick, pick, yeah, uh, yeah. pick a couple of your favorites. Um, sure. <laughs> So we definitely, um, in terms of working with clients when we do data visualization work, uh, what we found is that we very much follow a certain kind of pipeline. Okay. Um, in that, you know, often they'll either come to us with data or with questions. Sometimes there isn't even data yet, and we try to, um, and then we spend, you know, a decent amount of time going through that data and researching um, really what that data can can tell us. So sometimes there's hypotheses we try to confirm or not. Um, uh, and you know, or, or they, where we can't, and sometimes we have to go harvest more data, or we have to transform the data, or analyze it, or reduce it down. I mean, you know, a big question of big data is, you know, how do I visualize it? Well, you never really visualize big data. You first reduce it down to a, a meaningful subset, and then you visualize that, and at that point, it's already, uh, you know, a, of a the appropriate size to be visualized. So there's a definitely a, a kind of a, a cycle of you know cleaning up and transforming and analyzing and then visualizing. Okay. Um, you know we have um, on staff uh, an, an economist and statistician who uh, helps us a lot with that process, and it's been really great to uh, uh, Adam Highland to have him on board. And so um, that's a big part of it. And then you know when we do actually get to the point of needing to visualize it for the web, that's when a lot of these things come in because you know you think about uh, tools like jQuery. There's a million ways to accomplish the same thing, and some of those are going to be more organized and cleaner than others. And so, what ends up happening is that, um, uh, you know, we do see a lot of people making more and more data visualization, but we don't talk as much about the patterns quite yet of how it is that we do that right. I think we've done a really good job of that um, in just general JavaScript land with things like Backbone and Ember.js and Knockout and Angular. We're really, really pushing the envelope forward on. We see frameworks, and I think we're starting to do that also in data visualization, which is really what I talked about today, uh, which is the question of what does it mean to architect charts, and from our perspective, it's how do you make charts that are reusable, Right. which right. really um, you know, covers four concepts. Uh, one, that uh, repeatabil re repeatability. Repeatability, okay. Um, <laughs> tougher word than to, <laughs> Get to, the scroll of water. <laughs> yeah, to, uh, yeah, to be able to instantiate multiple versions of right, things in right. a chart to configurability, being able to give your users an API so that they have some control over how your chart looks. Uh, extensibility, being able to 
build on top of the charts you've already built without really just modifying that code. And then uh, composability, which is really kind of the the, um, the, the pinnacle of uh, database, which is when you start composing charts from other smaller charts and right. kind of um, making um, you know new things from from the old. So. Uh, that's what, what really D3 chart is okay. kind of about. So talk a little bit about kind of hypothesis-driven uh, visualization versus, you know, the, the proverbial, you know, again, you hear these great examples. I'm going to throw all this data in, and I'm going to have a visualization, and I'm going to find I'm going to find the needle in the haystack, right? I'm going to find some correlation, some relationship that sure. uh, that I had no idea, and it's going to solve the, all the world's problems and make get, get me promoted. So talk a little bit about when you're talking to clients, again, sure. using visualization as a tool. You know, what is yeah. kind of the hypothesis versus versus sure. the needle in the haystack? I'm just going to throw it in and scramble it up. And yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I think everyone wants that beautiful moment of you, you, you're running an average and suddenly something standing out. I mean, you know, that's the most basic, obviously, metric you can compute and uh, is never really never sufficient. But, um, but you know, it rarely does that happen. A lot of the times, uh, you know, the patterns you think are there aren't because they're driven by our everyday interaction and so on and you know it's really easy to mistake uh, correlation for causation yes I yes think. Um, that, that's <laughs> we see really that in the right in the media really, every day right the, exactly uh, that's a really common <laughs> pattern and so you know a lot of the times um, you know they'll come in and they'll say oh, we want to visualize this you know um, this particular type of data and we want to use this particular type of chart and that that very rarely works we have to sort of work with them to sort of really explore well what are we really saying? Mm -hmm. Because um, you know, I, I love data visualization, and I, but I also believe that everything is data visualization. Your Facebook feed is a data visualization. It's just you know, every single data element is a status, and then they happen to be a, in a, you know in a list. So um, the range of what you can build and still call it data visualization is really vast. And so the most important part is to sort of do right by the data right. um, and, and the kind of the narrative that we're trying to tell uh, here. So, you know, there's there's this whole big process that has to do with just visualizing the data in preparation for visualizing right. the data, <laughs> which is really, you know, it's funny. You can you can make a hundred scatter plots and line charts and, and look at distributions and things, and you're really all just doing that to get kind of a mental picture of what the data looks like. Right. And, you know, when that's all said and done, you, you sort of have a better idea of what you may want to highlight or not. Um, but you really can't get to that point until you really understand kind of what your data looks like. Right. Well, it's interesting you, sp you speak of the narrative, the narrative that's in the data, both both that which you want to get out of it as well as that which is in there that you're trying to extract. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a really... Uh, it's, it's a story, right? It it, just... It's a story, and I used to... Um, I used to have this, this slide in, in various talks that I would say where, it, where a data visualization is not objective because we think that data and visualizing it will result in this objective picture. But the reality is every choice you make is, is somehow going to uh, to impact the viewer. If you, if you think about just like taking a number and coloring it, right. if you color it blue, it may be interpreted as, as a temperature that's cold. If you color it red, it may be interpreted as, as something hot, right? right? And that's a really tiny, tiny thing. And so um, it, it's really easy sometimes if you just look for different visualizations of the same data to just see how different the narrative is right. um, because of the various color choices and the really, really small things. And so. It, you know, it's really important to balance those things. Um, it's really important for us to stay very true to the data. You know, we definitely would never um, create any visualization that, that, you know, lies, quote unquote. Right, we used um, to call that in college, how to lie with statistics. I mean, the, the, right, the classic case is your y-axis right. on a simple two, two scale. You know, you have a big y-axis, the deltas look oh, very, yeah. very small. You have a very compressed y-axis, and oh my oh, god, look yeah. at the... Look at the changes. Uh, definitely, I mean, got, we've seen pie charts from they've shoved 130 <laughs> percent. I've never, you know, I'd love to have 130 percent of a pie. But <laughs> so talk a little bit about kind of um, again as you're helping people figure out kind of where you know the method to, to most effectively get the information out of their data via virtualization. What are some of the kind of the tips and tricks, you know, kind of high level things that you lay out for them, you know, or do's and don'ts that that really should go into that first cut of of organization really planning to get to the end state? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, with your data and the quality of your data and are you capturing everything you should be capturing? Um, you know, we try to, uh, when we work with uh, folks helping them make APIs, uh, you know, we try to help them do that in a way that will allow them to then be able to analyze it. So uh, things like time series are really important. Um, 
a really important form of data because it really lets, lets you look at patterns over time. So that's a pretty common dimension that we like to capture. And, um, you know, I also think that it's it's important to get to a point where you're comfortable, uh, kind of just looking through your data. Um, one thing that I think became a pattern is people really jumping in on the uh, the real time analytics, and that's a really dangerous um, kind of territory to enter because it, it may cause us to impulsively react when we don't really need to. It's really important to understand the overall patterns of our systems and of our data, and then look for potential anomalies. And so um, that's been one thing that we kind of try to uh, also instill when real time data is involved. Um, but I, you know, I, I want to say that there are consistent patterns just in that process, but I don't, I don't really think so. Uh, I, I think the variety of data, and I think that's why in part data science and data visualization are becoming such an, an important uh, field and area of work is because um, there's just so many different applications that, right. that, that are coming uh, to play, which is why you know we're starting to come up with language to sort of separate them by, by size and, and uh, purpose and so on. But I think there's a lot of overlap between them. So. But that's an interesting take that you bring up with the real time, especially as, as again, we're talking about Internet of Things and industrial Internet, and there's going to be so much of this stuff. And to not react necessarily in real time to real time unless it's appropriate, because it may be masking something that's part of a much bigger trend or maybe an appropriate trend or the right right trend. Kind of like, what are you managing oh, to sure. question, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and in some situations, it's incredibly important, right? I mean... Uh, if, if you're in, in, a, in a medical field or you, you're flying airplanes, uh, it's, it's very important to react to real-time data. So I, I definitely don't want to take away from, uh, from that. But I think we've started bringing in some of those practices into places where it's really less urgent. Um, and, you know, there's a danger of kind of right, overreacting. Right. But context is always key. Context, context is, always is always key, right? Context is always key, absolutely. Okay, so we're about out of time. I want to ask you, there's got to be one great story that you have of working with a client um, and going through this process where maybe you found the golden nugget or there was the aha yeah. moment or everybody oh, sure. was caught by surprise. Do you have any good, uh, any fun stories to share with us? Um, I think probably one of my, my favorite pieces that we've done um, uh, last year was actually uh, while um, we worked with um, the Guardian Interactive team on the MISO project and one of the interactives we built was looking at um, donation data to the Somalia famine. And it was really interesting because we started also analyzing uh, just the media um, conversation around it and just really looking at whether there was correlation between donation behavior and then also uh, media publicity and so on. Um, and it, there really wasn't that, that tight an integration between the two, which is really interesting, you know, considering how important it is for uh, NGOs to reach out. And, and granted, this was not, um, we, we did not have data directly from NGOs. This was really much more, um, sort of high level and so on, but it was just really interesting to look at these completely two different pieces of information and try to figure out how to how to tell that story. Right, great. Well, thanks for coming on the queue. Thank you, yeah, I appreciate that. So Irene Ross from Boku, uh, she's a data visualization specialist. Um, I, I don't know if your keynote is online, hopefully they'll, they'll put the keynote up somewhere. Um, but again, thanks for coming on the queue. Thank you. We are here at the O'Reilly Fluent Conference in the, at the Hilton Hotel. We'll be here all day today, all day tomorrow. Again getting to the, the smartest people we can find in the room, asking them the questions that you wish you could ask them if you were here, and giving that information to you. So again, Jeff Frick, we got our next guest in just a few minutes on theCUBE. Be right back.